I'm going to begin on a personal note for reasons which I think will become clear at the end of the talk. Uh, the personal note is where the person who introduced me uh, began, namely how I became involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, I was always involved politically in one topic or another, mostly during the 1960s, even though I was still quite young, uh, in the Vietnam War, less so in the issues of civil rights. Uh, and I was also politically active in what were called back then uh, sex, not S-E-X, S-E-T-S, a uh, political sect uh, which fortunately no longer exists. Uh, and um, I only first became involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict in June 1982 when Israel invaded Lebanon. I then joined with a number of other dissenting Jews. We formed a little group called Jews against the Israeli massacre in Lebanon. And um, like most groups which get together, political groups, we began to argue and agree and disagree on political questions. And the, one of the questions that arose was whether or not you were a Zionist, a topic about which I knew next to nothing. And because I prefer, my preferred route in politics is to be uh, intellectually informed on the topics I become passionate about. It's not simply a matter of the heart. It also has to be, for me at any rate, a matter of the mind as well. Uh, I began to research the topic of Zionism to figure out where I stood on the issue. And after around a year of research, I decided, well, this is as good a dissertation topic as any, and I turned my research into my doctoral dissertation. I completed my research, I can date it almost exactly, I had completed my research about April 1984, and I was just about to embark on the writing phase of my doctoral dissertation when I walked into a bookstore uh, back then, it was called the publisher was called Harper and Row. Now it's called Harper Collins, and the uh, publisher Harper and Row had a little bookstore in Manhattan. And I walked into it uh, one day, and there was a book very prominently featured on the shelf. Uh, it was called From Time Immemorial. It was a hefty volume. A British uh, journalist later described it as the size and weight of a dried cow pet. And uh, <laughs> it was a hefty volume. And the book was on the origins, or claimed to be on the origins of the Arab-Jewish conflict over Palestine. Uh, and I turned to the back, the blurbs, which is for an academic one of the first things you do. First you check the blurbs and then you check the footnotes and I turned to the blurbs, and the blurbs were, by any reckoning, very impressive. It was a kind of who's who of American arts and letters. So there was a blurb by a famous historian, Barbara Tuckman, uh, said that the book was, quote, a historical event in itself. Then there was a blurb by a prominent Holocaust historian, Lucy DeWittowich, followed by a blurb by the Nobel laureate in literature, uh, Saul Bellow, followed by a blurb by the Nobel laureate, supposedly for peace, uh, Elie Wiesel. Uh, and each blurb was more uh, effusive in its praise for the book than the previous one. Uh, and quickly, the book received uh, a great national attention. It became a bestseller, went into seven hardback printings, uh, received raves, for example, from the editor-in-chief of the New Republic, a fellow by the name, he still is, Martin Peretz, said the book, if read, will change the history of the future. Uh, so it was clear that even though I loathed the notion, I had to read this book because for a doctoral dissertation, you have to be the last word. And this book did promise, 
its claim was it would totally revolutionize our understanding of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, its thesis is very simple to summarize. Uh, the, or the author or the alleged author, Joan Peters, claimed that Palestine had been empty before the Zionist settlers came, the Zionist settlers made the desert bloom, and after they made the desert bloom, all these Arabs from neighboring countries sneaked into Palestine to take advantage of the new economic opportunities and then pretended to be indigenous to the area. In a word, that the Palestinians were simply a myth. They were simply neighboring Arabs who were falsifying their genealogies. And the, the thesis on its face seemed, to put it mildly, it seemed preposterous. Uh, there's a huge body of literature, scholarly literature on the topic, a huge body which I had just completed reading, and this sort of thesis never even appeared. And one would wonder how could that fact have been overlooked, as it were. Nonetheless, it's also true to say that I did not dismiss the book out of hand. Many people who were sympathetic to the Palestinian struggle did dismiss the book peremptorily as nonsense. I did not do that. And I did that for, you could say, personal political reasons. Those being that in my youth, I subscribed to beliefs about which I was 100% certain, about which I had read an enormous about, amount about, and which many people in positions of academic authority had validated. So even if this humble yours truly was wrong about the topic, there were many people who I respected greatly, and actually to this day I respect, who said, no, it's true. X is true, Y is true. And so I was very confident as a youth about certain of my convictions and beliefs. And sometimes history has a way of sort of crashing in on you. And in the late 1970s, certain of my beliefs uh, suffered a cave-in as history crashed in. And I discovered that many of the things about which I was 100.1% certain, and many of the beliefs of which people in quite respectable academic positions confirmed as being valid, they were wrong. And that was a, as the expression has it, it was a sobering and chastening experience for me. It left me bedridden for about a month. It was a physical, had its physical repercussions. Uh, it's very hard when you discover that something you deeply believe in is wrong. And one thing I learned from that experience was not to do it again. That I'm not going to uh, make that mistake again because it's a personal thing. I don't want to be made a fool of again. Uh, it had nothing to do with other people, it had to do with me. I felt I had been a fool. And so when the Peters book came out, even though as I said, on its face, and most people thought it was preposterous, that was not a satisfactory answer to me. I had to be able to know that it was wrong, if it was wrong. And so I sat down with the book. Peters liked to go around proclaiming that the book had 1,852 footnotes. It did, and I went at that book like Captain Ahab went after Moby Dick. I went to the New York City Research Library, a very beautiful, great library, and I started to go through the footnotes one by one by one by one. And I then uh, took, there was a demographic study which was the core of the book, and in fact the demographic study had been validated with a letter in the back of the book 
by the head of population research at the University of Chicago, another formidable personality. Nonetheless, validated by authority or not, I sat down and started to go at that demographic study. It formed the core of the book and there were tables in the back which tabulated her findings. And I went at it and at it and at it. It was very densely written. And one, uh, early one morning, it was around 1.30 a.m., I suddenly, my, well, suddenly my eyes start to water and that tingling finger, uh, feeling going down your spine, I discovered that the key number in that study was a fraud. It wasn't just wrong. It was clear, it's impossible to demonstrate now, that the number had been faked. And absent that number, the thesis collapsed. Well, it was one of those moments, a dear friend of mine who recently passed away, uh, the economist Paul Sweezy, maybe one or two people in the room have heard of him. Anyone hear of him? I wonder if he... Okay, so Sweezy uh, said to me later on, discovering a hoax is every scholar's eureka. <laughs> and that was my eureka moment. I discovered the Freud. I live in a very tiny studio apartment, the Raskolnikov type apartment. And I got up and I remember I paced back and forth. Uh, I did it, I did it, I did it. And I was very excited and of course at a moment like that you want to, to use the new age language, you want to share it with someone. Uh, I didn't know who to share it with at 1.30 a.m. but I am Jewish so I called my mother. Uh, <laughs> and I told her, I called her up and I said, Mom, I did it, I did it, I did it. And like a good Jewish mother, she said, I'm very happy for you, I'm very proud of you, and then finally, what did you do? Uh, <laughs> and I said, I discovered a fraud, a hoax. Um, and then for the next few months, I proceeded to systematically document the fraud. The truth be told, I discovered it around June, and I had everything written up by December. It took about six months. It wasn't so complicated because the fraud was pretty, uh, pretty uh, pitiful. Uh, the real challenge was trying to publicize my findings because so many institutions and individuals of prominence had already been invested in the fraud saying it's the greatest thing not only since sliced bread but saran wrap as well. How does it look when a graduate student who's only been studying the topic for two years, I had not even picked up a book before 1982, how does it look when a graduate student is able to detect a fraud and all of these authorities and experts were claiming this book is a historical event? And it took a very long time to finally bring the fraud to public attention. 